Artists shouldn't own their art and inventors shouldn't own their inventions. In fact, any form of intellectual property protection constitutes a criminal threat that should be abolished. Here's why. In this video, I'll explain the nature of property rights' conflict-avoiding norms. I will then show how IP drives us towards the destruction of civilization while stifling creativity. I will also debunk every pro-IP argument ever and demonstrate that copying other people's ideas is a fundamental part of being human. First, to demonstrate that intellectual property rights are strictly impossible, we consider the nature of property. To say that a person A has a property right in X is to say that A should win any conflict over the use of X. Briefly, a conflict is defined as contradictory actions. So if Crusoe is using a stick to spearfish and Friday comes along and tries to use that same stick to stoke his fire, we have a conflict. The two actions cannot take place simultaneously. One action excludes the other. Here we see that having a property right in X is necessarily exclusionary. We see that something is scarce if, when you use it, you exclude other people from being able to use it at the same time. The issue with so-called intellectual property is that ideas are not scarce, so you cannot have a property right in an idea. If Crusoe finds a stick in nature and figures out how to use it to fish, his use of the stick excludes Friday, but his use of the idea of spearfishing does not exclude Friday. Friday is fully capable of finding a different stick and using it to spearfish at the exact same time. We notice that Friday has to find a different stick, but he does not have to find a different idea. One person having an idea excludes nobody else from having that same idea at the same time. So conflicts over ideas are simply impossible. Therefore, if Crusoe were to exclude other people from using his idea of spearfishing, he is not doing so in defence of a property right. Instead, he is criminally threatening and or attacking people who want to use their own property to spearfish. If a man comes up with a new mousetrap design, patents it and claims to everyone else that they are no longer allowed to use that same design, he is indirectly threatening them with violence through the use of the state. Intellectual property, therefore, for constitutes a criminal threat, and crime is something to be opposed. Furthermore, to adopt a consistent intellectual property ethic is to accept ethical stasis. The IP ethic could be stated that any latecomer to an idea must first ask the first comer to that idea permission before they may use it. But anyone who's not the first guy who thought of the idea of asking someone else's permission in order to use their idea must ask his permission in order to ask someone else's permission but they must first ask his permission to ask his permission, and so on ad infinitum. The IP ethic, then, implies the near immediate cessation of all action, and therefore implies the death of humanity, so it cannot possibly make for a human ethic. On these grounds, I shall refer to these IP threats not as genuine property, but as intellectual monopoly grants. I believe this distinction is important. Calling these monopoly grants intellectual property makes them sound as if they are a genuine feature of law which they are not. It is this false naming which has led several online leftists to decry IP as taking good communal property into the clutches of evil private ownership, when in fact intellectual monopoly is commie garbage and should be treated as such. So we have it that IP is not a genuine feature of law, but what about people who don't care about matters of justice and think that it should still be obeyed because it is essential for capital development? Economists who chart human development use the shorthand of the hockey stick graph, meaning if a line graph were drafted of the advancement of humanity from the beginning of recorded time to the present, it starts as a fucking plateau, then beginning in the late 18th and early 19th century, it fires off to fucking Neptune. What many economists, particularly, sadly, of the Austrian variety, often neglect to acknowledge is that this sudden surge in technological advancement perfectly coincides with the advent of intellectual property protections in the United States. And by Rageaholic's assertion here, I cannot help but to similarly conclude based upon this graph that pandemic illnesses actually increase the human population, so we best resurrect smallpox and send it on its way. It's of course simple to see the problem with this line of reasoning when used to prove that an illness which directly causes death actually increases the population. We understand that the causal relationship between death and population is that the former decreases the latter. Similarly, for IP, we can demonstrate that the necessary causal relationship between criminal copy threats and capital development is that the former hinders the latter. In a sentence, we can see that IP enacts a de-civilizing tendency. To explain, consider that IP reduces the scope of activities one may use their own property for. If I own a quarry and my neighbour owns a similar quarry on his land, and he uses his stone to build a statue, there is now one less use I have for my stone. Therefore, the expected gains I can make from my quarry will go down as more novel arrangements of stone are found by others. In other words, as more intellectual monopolies are assigned over uses 
pieces of stone, men will value it less as there will be fewer ends that it can attain. We note further that these means like stone, which are being affected by intellectual monopolies in this way, can only come into the ownership of men in three ways. Production, homesteading, or trade. Therefore, IP will raise the opportunity cost of these activities, thus tending men into alternative uses of their time. We notice that the alternative to these laborious activities are leisure activities. Thus, under IP, you should expect there to be more leisure than otherwise. But more leisure means a higher time preference. Leisure is what men do when they want present satisfaction. It is in contradistinction to saving, and saving has to come about through production, homesteading or trade. Therefore, IP discourages saving in favour of present satisfaction. In the unhampered market, there is a natural tendency for time preferences to lower, so we can say that IP enacts a counter tendency causing time preferences to raise. But it is specifically low time preferences which are the characteristic mark of civilization. A large indirect exchange economy is entirely useless to a man who wants to immediately satisfy any urge he may feel like an animal beast. For exchange to even be possible in the first place, there has to be some amount of saving. Therefore, counter to rageaholics above assertion, intellectual monopoly is a destructive force against capital development, not a preserving one. Kinsella explains that intellectual monopolies are a form of negative easement. They are in order that other people aren't allowed to do certain things with their own property. Because IP is specifically a criminal negative easement, as opposed to a voluntarily agreed upon one, it has the same effect as expropriation. Let us recall that IP rights give to pattern creators partial rights of control, ownership, over the tangible property of everyone else. The pattern creator has a partial ownership of others' property, by virtue of his IP right, because he can prohibit them from performing certain actions with their own property. Author X, for example, can prohibit a third party Y from inscribing a certain pattern of words on Y's own blank pages with Y's own ink. That is, by merely authoring an original expression of ideas, by merely thinking of and recording some original pattern of information, or by finding a new way to use his own property, the IP creator instantly magically becomes a partial owner of others' property. He has some say over how third parties can use their property. IP rights change the status quo by redistributing property from individuals of one class, tangible property owners, to individuals of another, authors and inventors. Prima facie, therefore, IP law trespasses against or takes the property of tangible property owners by transferring partial ownership to authors and inventors. It is this invasion and redistribution of property that must be justified in order for IP rights to be valid. Furthermore, even if we set aside the epistemological failure of Rageaholic's empiricist methodology, let's look at the history of the steam engine, surely a driving force in the Industrial Revolution. It has been argued that the Industrial Revolution took place when it took place, largely because patents giving inventors a period of monopoly power were first introduced by enlightened rulers at that time. The exemplary story of James Watt, the prototypical inventor on entrepreneur of the time is often told to confirm the magic role of patents in spurring innovation and growth. As we pointed out in the introduction, this is far from being the case. The pricing policy of Bolton and Watt's enterprise was a classical example of monopoly pricing. Over and above the cost of materials needed to build the steam engine, they would charge royalties equal to one third of the fuel cost savings attained by their engine in comparison to the Newcomen engine. Notice two interesting properties of this scheme. It allows for price discrimination, and it is founded on the hypothesis that, thanks to patent protection, no further technological improvement will take place. It allows for price discrimination because, given the transport technology of the time, the price of coal and horses, the alternative to the Newcomen engine being horses, varied substantially from one region to another. It assumes that technological improvement will be stifled because it is based on the idea that only the Watt engine could use less coal than the Newcomen engine. No surprise then that Bolton and Watt spent most of their time fighting in court any inventor, such as Jonathan Hornblower, who tried to introduce a machine either superior to theirs or at least superior to the Newcomen engine. It will also come as no surprise to our readers that, in the Cornwall region, where copper and tin were mined and coal was expensive, a number of miners took to pirating the engine. This naturally brought about a legal dispute with Bolton and Watt, which ended only in 1799 with the symbolic victory of the two monopolists. Symbolic because their patent expired only a year later. Bolton and Watt appear correct in their assessment that the monopoly grant would prevent technological development. During the period of Watt's patents, the United Kingdom added about 750 horsepower of steam engines per year. In the 30 years following Watt's patents, additional horsepower was added at a rate of more than 4,000 per year. Moreover, the fuel efficiency of the steam engines changed little during this period of Watt's patent. However, between 1810 and 1835, it is estimated to have increased by a factor of 5. After the expiration of Watt's patents, not only was there an explosion in the production and efficiency of engines, but also steam power came into its own as the driving force of the Industrial Revolution. Over a 30-year period, steam engines were modified and improved as crucial innovations such as the steam train, the steamboat, and the steam jet.
again it came into wide usage. The key innovation was the high pressure steam engine, development of which had been blocked by Watt's strategic use of his patent. Many new improvements to steam engines such as those of William Bull, Richard Trevithick and Arthur Wolfe became available by 1804. Although they had been developed earlier, these innovations were kept idle until the Bolton and Watt patent expired. None of these innovators wished to incur the same fate as Hornblower. This is hardly surprising. After all, it's competition, this drive to survive, which impels men to innovate. If a man has a monopoly grant, he will shift resources away from innovation towards maintaining his monopoly. I do understand that perhaps rage is not the most able proponent of intellectual monopoly, so I'll turn to a similar claim made by academic agent. And this brings me finally to the utilitarian grounds for supporting intellectual property. Why are property rights good at all, aside from the moral question of Lockean homesteading? They are good because they ensure that the land is subjected to a self-interested monitor. Someone who owns their own home is more likely to look after it than somebody who only rents, and even more so than somebody who is simply given that home by the government. When land is held in common, it is said to lead to the tragedy of the commons. The monopoly ownership of intellectual property by the original author or whoever they sell those deeds to function in the same way. You have a self-interested monitor looking over how the IP is treated. The problem here is that the tragedy of the commons only applies to scarce physical means, as these means can be degraded with use. An idea, on the other hand, cannot possibly be degraded. If 7 million people each piss into a urinal one after the other, the urinal will indeed be degraded with this use. But if 7 million people read the same story written by the same person, the idea will be the exact same at the end as it was at the beginning. Ideas cannot be degraded. Should one of these people like the story and want to tell their own version of it, this is not a degradation of the original. Rather, they are telling a new, but similar story. The creators of The Lion King are quick to point out their inspiration from Shakespeare's Hamlet, but this does not make The Lion King and Hamlet the same story. Further, each of the Star Wars movies takes place within the same universe with many of the same characters, but this does not make A New Hope and The Empire Strikes Back the same movie. Ideas simply cannot be degraded with use or adaptation. Furthermore, academic agents seem confused about what conflict even means. As I said earlier, it is easy to imagine a situation on the free market whereby Walt Disney would hire a security company to protect the distribution and sale of Mickey Mouse products. Why wouldn't there be physical conflict over a five billion dollar a year asset? Conflict doesn't just mean when somebody gets sufficiently annoyed by what you're doing that they physically prohibit you from doing it. Conflicts are contradictory actions. In a free market, Walt Disney may well get pissed off that John is making Mickey Mouse cartoons, but his annoyance does not demonstrate there to be conflict. In fact, there only exists a conflict after Disney sends his goons to criminally harass John. The Disney goons can't prevent John from using his typewriter at the same time that John uses his typewriter. There is a conflict. One action excludes the other. This confusion poisons AA's understanding of the conflict avoidance theory of homesteading. Kinsella goes on to argue that ideas can be homesteaded like land can, because they are not physical and therefore cannot be owned. He justifies this by redefining locks mixing the land with labour by the concept of occupancy. So in Kinsella's conception, it's not mixing the land with labour, it's occupying the land, possessing it as he puts it. The claim is not that you can't have a property right in an idea because you can't occupy it. Rather, the claim is that you can't have a property right in an idea because conflicts over ideas simply cannot occur. These are indeed related. It is the case that occupying something prevents others from being able to occupy it at the same time. But I don't see Kinsella taking occupancy as the root of his theory. In other words, Kinsella hasn't just arbitrarily swapped out mixing labour with occupancy. Rather, he has reformulated homesteading in terms of conflict. To sum up, it's not you can't occupy ideas, therefore you can't have property ideas. It's you can't occupy ideas, therefore there can't be conflicts over ideas, therefore you can't have property in an idea. AA moves on with another example of a property right in something intangible, stating that It is clear that time has a value to people, that we in some sense own our own time. If time were not our own, the Austrian justification for wage labour would sink. So we must de facto own our own time. But this simply is not the case. The Austrian justification for wage labour is built from the ground up on the title transfer theory of contracts. Nowhere am I aware of an Austrian claiming that it is time that you are selling. Such would strike me as being far too romantic. Rather, in hiring a labourer for 30 ounces of gold, it is the 30 ounces which is being transferred from me to the labourer on the condition that he perform the labour. He isn't transferring ownership of his labour to me. Rather, I am conditionally transferring the title to the gold to him. AA moves on to an attempt to claim that Hans Hermann Hoppe's theory of property is in fact consistent with IP, to which I'll leave the man himself to respond to. Recall I said um, property rights uh, can only be acquired in things that are scarce and 
only because they are scarce are conflicts over their use possible. Now, ideas, once they have been thought, are no longer scarce. If I think the same idea that you think, I'm not taking anything away from you. You can still think exactly the same thing as, uh, as before. Nothing is diminished uh, on, your, um, on your part. Thoughts are, once they have been thought, free goods. Um, and conflicts over them are impossible. Imagine what the consequences would be if we would not accept this view. Um, so then we would, then we would conceivably owe royalties to the widow of Aristotle uh, until the end of our lives. I mean, it's not even the widow has not survived up to this town point either. But whatever Aristotle's uh, little Aristoteles uh, run around, run around there in in Greece, um, they might still collect uh, money whenever we say. Uh, a and none A cannot exist at the same time. I mean, I think I would consider that to be utterly unfair because I can think this idea myself also. I would not have needed Aristotle to come up with this idea, but nonetheless, he was the first one to write it down. But the pro-IP thesis may be modified slightly to claim that intellectual monopoly doesn't necessarily increase capital development, but it does increase technological development, i.e. man's understanding of nature as is claimed by Kristen Osenga. With patent rights, what we've gotten is a ton of innovation over the last number of centuries. Great inventions, fantastic inventors that are worthy of being protected, and we're all enjoying the results of this activity. If we don't have this strong patent system that has allowed for this level of innovation going forward, we might get less innovation and a lot less cool toys to play with. However, as we know, intellectual monopoly necessarily enacts a tendency towards the destruction of capital goods, and capital goods are often useful in discovering facts about nature. Imagine Newton trying to demonstrate that white light is in fact made up of all the colours of the spectrum without using any glass prisms. It would seem he'd probably be out of luck. However, capital is not per se required to increase man's technological knowledge. Therefore, intellectual monopoly simply shifts discoveries away from those that are heavily dependent on a large capital structure towards those that are less dependent on it. If and insofar as this is the case, this warping of technological discoveries is a hampering force on the market, implying a lower standard of living than otherwise. Imagine the reductional case of IP grants being so effective at spurring the discovery of facts about the mechanisms behind cancer treatments that all means of society are thus allocated towards research in order to find new facts about said mechanisms. In such a society, everyone would die very, very quickly, as there'd be nobody farming any food or collecting any water. In short, if and insofar as intellectual monopoly increases technological development, it increases it too much. And on the topic of pharmaceutical development in particular, Kinsella has this to say. Um, as for pharmaceuticals, um, the idea, first of all, anyone who's interested, you can't do this while we're debating, but you should read chapter 9 of Bolger and Levine's book, Against Intellectual Monopoly. They completely explode all the myths about the pharmaceutical industry needing patents and being and requiring patents. Uh, so let's take COVID as an example. Right now, there's 11 different vaccines that have been approved for emergency use somewhere in the world. And as, December of, as of December 2020 last year, there were over 200 vaccine candidates being, being developed and at least 52 were in clinical or human trials. So there's lots of innovation going on. And Moderna on October 20 waived its patent rights. So if it needs a patent to recoup its costs, why did it waive its patent rights? Look. Italy and Switzerland didn't even have drug patents until the late 70s, and they were th some of the leading uh, uh, creators of drugs. Just as an example, Bolger and Levine, they did a study. They looked to a poll uh, at the British Medical Journal's readers on the top medical milestones in history. They found that almost none of them had anything to do with patents. Penicillin, x-rays, tissue culture, and aesthetics, uh, chlorprom... I can't read that one. Public sanitation, germ theory, evidence-based medicine, vaccines, birth control pill, computers, oral, rehy oral rehydration therapy, DNA structure, monoclonal antibody technology, and the discovery of the health risks of smoking. Of the top 15 entries, only two had anything to do with patents. And the Center for Disease Control in the U.S., they had a list of the top 10 public health achievements of the 20th century. None of them had anything to do with patents. Uh, a review of the – even a review of the most important pharmaceuticals reveals that many came about without the motive or the possibility of acquiring a patent, including like aspirin, AZT, cyclosporine, digoxin, ether, fluoride, insulin, 
medical marijuana, methadone, morphine, oxytocin, penicillin, phenobarbital, prontosil, quinine, Ritalin, Salversan, vaccines, and vitamins. So you don't need patents to develop drugs. And those patents that do exist for pharmaceutical drugs are responsible for countless deaths and many ruined lives. Ever wonder why insulin is so expensive to purchase but so cheap to produce? As unique name Isaurus explains, the fault lies with patenting. Three companies each have active patents that cover one or two of the four known types of modern insulin essential for type 1 diabetes, and it doesn't get any more impossible to replicate than literally illegal. And while original patents have expired, new patents that cover new formulations and advancements have had so little difference with the original that replicators of the original are still liable for patent infringement. Which you can tell because companies trying to make their own insulin like the Open Insulin Project and Lynette are specifically trying to make and approve a biosimilar, not a bioreplicate, a generic, which is easier to get approved. Until we make one, the big three price fix and there are big million view videos showing the patents, companies and price fixing they're involved in, but none mentioned price fixing cartels don't work unless you prevent replication. All you've done is create incentives for new companies and the cartel stops being profitable if you have to invite them all in. So if intellectual monopoly grants are not necessary to, and in fact don't spur innovation, what is their true purpose? Kinsella explains that copyright originated as a tool of censorship. Copyright has its origins in censorship and thought control, so it's no wonder that's what it still does today. So the seminal German silent film Nosferatu, which some of you may have heard of and even seen, was, was deemed a derivative work of Dracula, and courts ordered all copies destroyed. Now luckily someone preserved a copy, and that's why we still have it today. Um, there was one time about 2005, a grocery store in Canada mistakenly sold 14 copies of the new Harry Potter book a few days before its official release. And so a British Columbia Supreme Court judge ordered customers not to talk about the book, copy it, or even read it before its official release date. Copyright also threatens freedom on the internet, which is very serious because the internet is one of the most important tools we have in the fight for freedom to fight state, state um, tyranny. Um, and just a few years ago, the Stop Online Piracy Act, or SOPA, was only narrowly defeated um, by, by an, internet, an uprising on, on the internet. Uh, Aaron Swartz, who some of you may have heard of, was a brilliant young inventor of RSS, the technology behind blogging and podcasting, and he was an anti-SOPA activist. He uploaded some academic journal articles to the internet, and he was facing life in prison for federal copyright uh, infringement, and he killed himself. There was a grad student in Britain named Richard O'Dwyer who had a website with hyperlinks to other people's pirated movies. And the U.S. went after him and finally got a judge to order him to be extradited to the United States to face federal prison. He finally escaped it, uh, but his life was almost ruined and derailed for many years. And these odious abuses continue to this day. Just recently Kanye West has been prevented from making a shirt that say that white lives matter because the trademark for that phrase is held by two radio hosts who explicitly keep it in order to prevent other people from spreading that message. We want you to meet two black radio hosts from Arizona who are taking action to stop the spread of the phrase White Lives Matter. So these radio hosts trademarked the phrase. Ramses Ja and Quentin Ward host the nationally syndicated weekly racial justice radio show Civic Cipher and they join us now. Gentlemen, great to see you. So uh, Ramses, yeah, yeah. let me start with you. What do you plan to do with this trademark of White Lives Matter? Well, um, at present we plan to do nothing. Um, nothing is plenty, uh, as you can imagine. It, it will not be used to hurt, harm, uh, trigger uh, any, any people, and, and as long as we are the uh, people in the position to decide how it is uh, used in commerce, uh, we will do our best to minimize the effect that it may have on people. So Quentin, just, ex just, people just explain that. So you, you, by design, don't plan to do anything with it, and that means that nobody else can. Is that the point? At present, yes. Far from protecting the ability of thinkers to express novel ideas, intellectual monopoly is a tool of censorship and domination over others. And the situation is not much better for patents. Rather than being used by the little guy who just wants to get his invention onto the market, they are used by large firms in lawsuit wars, as Kinsella explains. What happens is you have large companies amass huge patent treasure troves, uh, for As a good example of this was the recent smartphone patent wars about seven or eight years ago between Apple and Samsung and Motorola. And they all, you know, Apple suing because uh, someone else had a smartphone with a touchscreen and rounded corners because they had a patent on that. And, and then they're being countersued. What you, what you do is if you're a large company, you have tens of thousands of patents, which you've paid lawyers like me to get for you, right? And you didn't reward your inventors for. And 
when someone sues you for patent infringement, you look, you look through your pile of patents and you sue, you countersue them for some. So the patent lawsuits go on for five years, uh, and they finally settle with each other and they grant a cross license. And in the meantime, little companies are left out in the cold because if they tried to enter this fray, they'd be sued into oblivion because they don't have 10,000 patents to go after the large companies with. And it's because of this that companies are able to form cartels. They can group up, charge insanely high prices while sharing technology only with each other. As Rothbard explains, it's impossible to form such cartels in the free market. From the Civil War down to, the, down to about 1900, 18, late 1890s, prices were generally falling, and they were falling for good reason, namely the business was so competitive and the economy was so productive but the supply of goods and services was increasing at a rapid rate. In other words, that's when America industrialized. It was the biggest uh, per period of economic growth in the history of the world. But it, so in this situation, the uh, many business groups who tended to be inefficient try to cor correct this, try to try to correct this price falling situation by organizing cartels. In other words, by organizing a cartel of each industry so that they could cut production and raise prices. So they tried this systematically. This was the ideology, so to speak, among businessmen, <clears throat> that the way to benefit for all of us is to have quotas, either formal quotas as in cartels or in mergers where you, you just agree that you'll have certain shares of this corporation and then we'll cut production and raise prices. That was the great goal. All of this was a total flop a -roo. And case after case, hundreds, literally hundreds of cases of this kind of merger or cartel, they all flopped. And they flopped... Uh, um, for two basic reasons. One is, well, the basic reason is that the industry is free. Government cannot did, did not step in and, and force people to accept the cartel or accept the merger. So what happens is that when the, as soon as the cartel is formed or the merger is, is completed, and we have, and then they cut production, and raise prices, and profits go up. Other businessmen come in and say, "Hey, this looks like a great industry here. The the zinc, the zinc and whatever the zinc industry or the oil industry or the whatever railroads." They're making a lot of profits. Let's nip in there and, and now compete them because they're raising prices, they're, and we're, we're going to now come in with a new firm, a new factory, a new railroad, and we'll uh, we'll bust them. And that's exactly what happened. So you had new new competition always coming in and and uh, out competing the, the the older firms, and then the older firms are stuck with a new firm. Then you have a permanent competitor, which is a big pain in the neck because they come in with later equipment, with new factories and new equipment, the latest. Uh, the latest technology, etc. Now they have a permanent new competitor on their hands, so it became the whole thing became a big pain in the neck for them, and that's one reason. And then internally, what happened? What happened was that individual firms would start breaking the cartel and say, "Look, we we raised." In other words, the cartel restricts production, raises prices. Prices are very high, and then the individual firm says, "Look, uh, I'm not supposed to do this because I have a cartel agreement with the rest of my buddies in the, in the industry," but. Uh, Here's what we're going to do for you, my old pal and drinking buddy, or whatever, the, my buyer. Uh, I will sell you the steel or the whatever, titanium, etc., for 20% off list, provided you don't tell anybody about it. Okay. So what you have is a secret price cutting, <clears throat> and um, uh, and, if, and then this firm gains profits, gains sales, and of course the secret leaks out pretty quickly after about six months or a year, and then the other firms get very mad about this, and they call you your rate buster, which is the, in business terms is equivalent to scab in union terms. And, uh, and the whole cartel falls apart with mutual recrimination and hatred, and they're back where they started, except now they've got more hatred than they had before. Some of the, uh, each step of the way, some of the f more far-sighted in the sense of realizing this was a flop uh, among the business groups, decided the only way to preserve a cartel, or preserve a merger, is to have the government enforce it. The term, turn of the political arm to create the cartel for you. And this, uh, this was the origin of progressive regulation. The progressive system was not a group of far-sighted, uh, essentially it was not a group of far-sighted intellectuals who sat around and said we have to plan, we have to curb businessmen for the sake of the public interest. There's a group of bu groups of businessmen saying we have to impose cartels through the government uh, and thereby eliminating our competition, curbing the, the, the maverick firm which doesn't want to engage in a cartel. And, uh, and gaining profits that way.
Printers! With 8 million views worth of complaints about insane ink markups, chips that waste ink by design, and countless others, everyone knows this one. They say it's due to the razor and blades model, but razors don't have this abuse. In truth, modern inkjet printers have four essential parts and each is patented by a different company. Used to be a ton of companies trying to invent it and patenting each part as they went, but these four made the essentials, so they shared them. But only with each other. It's a cartel, same as insulin. IE did a report on the details, but this is why you can't find inkjet printers from anyone other than Canon, Epson, HP or brother. Try googling it. Even big tech companies like Samsung, despite investing in laser printers, don't make inkjet. In contrast, laser printers didn't have these essentials and could be better replicated. That's why dozens of companies make them and... I'm only going to be hating on inkjet printers like this one. Laser printers get a pass. Less potential abuse. Many will accept this potential for copyright to allow people to criminally censor dissenting opinions, but still support it for the protection it gives to creators. The argument is that authors, artists and other creatives need this protection so that others don't plagiarise their work and completely prevent them from making any profit off it whatsoever. The argument then goes on to claim that this will discourage people from creating anything, as they know someone's just going to take the creation and leave them in the dirt. This argument, of course, ignores that small artists already behave as if copyright doesn't exist. If you commission an artist to draw something, they'll generally only release a low resolution or watermarked version before payment is finalised. This is because they have no recourse should the art be yoinked and used without permission. This small artist hardly has the resource to fight a lengthy legal battle over a picture being used without consent. Moreover, the example of art commissions gives us an insight into what all creative work could look like sans intellectual monopoly. The artist is paid for production rather than distribution. Similarly, not having intellectual monopoly doesn't mean people are going to stop wanting big budget Marvel movies. It's just that Disney couldn't make a profit by preventing other people from sharing those movies. Rather, they could shift the point of purchase to before the movie is made, through some sort of crowdfunding goal or something. Star Citizen has earned over half a billion dollars in crowdfunding, more than the budget of any movie ever. With this model, creators want not only to fund the production itself, but they also want to roll up any profits they need in order to make it worth their time into the goal. So all Disney would have to do for their next Star Wars show is set the goal at the amount that it costs to make the show, plus whatever profits they want to make from it. If their goal is too high, we see other companies coming in and bidding it down. We have competition for who consumers want to see produce the next movie. We also have historic precedent for creators being able to profit without copyright. Baldwin and Levine point out in Against Intellectual Monopoly that in the 19th century people were free to republish any foreign works in the United States without authorization from the copyright holder. This was a fact that greatly upset Charles Dickens, whose works, along with those of many other English authors, were widely distributed in the United States, and yet American publishers found it profitable to make arrangements with English authors. Evidence before the 1976-8 commission shows that English authors sometimes received more from the sale of their books by American publishers, where they had no copyright, than from their royalties in England, where they did have copyright. In short, without copyright, authors still got paid, some sometimes more without copyright than with it. Baldwin and Levine point out further that modern creations which are not able to be copyrighted can nevertheless make money thanks to the first move advantage, citing the 9-11 commission report. The fact that this report was commissioned by the US government meant that monopoly grants over republishing were not issued. Despite this, W.W. W. Norton, who had a deal with the US government to get early access to the report, were able to turn a hefty profit, even though they had to foot the bill for rushed printing and they could not prevent other people from publishing the same report. One might worry what a world without copyright would do to the state of canon. If there are 10 Star Wars Episode 9s, which one is the real Star Wars Episode 9? We have an example of this with the SCP community, which is a collaborative writing project about a secret government agency whose job it is to investigate paranormal occurrences. Everything contributed to the SCP project is licensed Creative Commons, meaning nobody has the absolute say to decide which story is canon. Regardless, authors have managed to self-organise and decide which canon universe each story fits into, and much interaction is able to happen across different stories stories. This model of sharing stories between authors that makes SCP successful works elsewhere too. TikTok makes absolute bank on a business model of routinely infringing on copyrighted content. Just about every large YouTuber and streamer make a lot of their money from reacting to and repurposing other people's content. Evidently, there's a massive demand for this type of infringing content. To ban it all would mean less creations that people desire. Moreover, with one's creations open to competition, you're incentivized to be ever more creative to prevent others from stealing your fanbase. In a zero IP world, George Lucas would not get away with the abuse he performed to the Star Wars franchise. Don't like how he made Greedo try and shoot Han? Edit it yourself and release a superior version. Don't like the direction he took the prequel trilogy? Again, make your own version and compete with him. It is only when creatives start ruining their art in the eyes of the consumer that other people are able to sap away their audience. 
This means art will be better without IP. Without IP, your favourite games, movies and TV shows would receive constant new updates so long as there's a community who wants to provide that new content rather than being cut off of the arbitrary whims of some studio exec. Hollywood itself routinely creates derivative works, as Kirby Ferguson explains. The domination of sequels, remakes and adaptations is not new. From 2012 to 2021, 92 out of 100 of each year's top 10 hits are either sequels, remakes or adaptations. And in four of these years, it's every single film in the top 10. And even where a story isn't a direct remake or sequel of some previous story, it is still utilising pre-established rules of the genre. This is how screenwriters are able to form models of stories such as Dan Harmon's Story Circle or Blake Snyder's Story Beats. Tropes of a given genre must be adhered to at least to some extent such that we can even recognise it as being part of that genre in the first place. To subvert literally every rule would make a non-story which fits into no genre, thus removing the entire purpose of storytelling in the first place. Kirby elaborates further that the very method one uses to create in the first place involves copying from the previous body of work. We use ideas that we already understand, modify and assemble these ideas in new and interesting ways to have something new. Star Wars pioneered a new genre of science fiction by merging together sci-fi with adventure serials, westerns, war films, and samurai films. Quentin Tarantino's early films clearly copied elements from countless other films. Jordan Peele's Get Out followed the template of The Stepford Wives and transformed the feminist horror drama of the original into a nightmare about secretive racism and the best superhero film was created in this same way, by remixing ideas from the past to create something that is both new and familiar. We can summarise this into the following steps of creation. 1. Copy. Use the previous body of ideas as a soil from which the life of creation may spawn. 2. Transform. This step is analogous to an evolutionary process. Small tweaks are performed until something new and good is found. And 3. Combine. Take previous copied and transformed elements and combine them into something that is greater than its constituent parts. This is the exact way that the fundamental tool of human communication, language, is formed. We utilise the previous body of words, combine and transform them in different ways to make new words. In a very real sense, to be human is to copy. Moreover, this pay for production model isn't particularly alien elsewhere. Yes, your contribution to the Star Wars Episode 10 Kickstarter doesn't actually guarantee that you'll get to see the thing, but similarly, if only you were willing to go on cruise ships, they wouldn't run them just for you. Many other people also have to want to go on that same cruise ship in order for it to be profitable. Similarly, it might be the case that pay for production means you have to wait longer to consume the product after paying for it. But not only will there be far lower time preferences sans IP as discussed above, we also already have precedent for people paying for tickets for games and concerts, or paying for events like weddings months or even years in advance. We know that people are willing to wait long periods after paying to engage with something they are truly passionate about. And if they didn't have to pay for every subpar piece of art that came across them and they could instead get them for free, they would truly have even more money to pay for those things that they genuinely do care about. Moreover, most online content creators are already paid for production. Art commissions, coffee, Patreon, these are all examples of pay for production. If YouTubers are able to make it work, why the hell couldn't Disney figure it out? And if Disney can't figure it out, maybe they should get fucked and let smarter competition take their fan base. Also, on the point of plagiarism, just because it's not criminal to copy someone else's work without crediting them, this does not mean you can get away with it. As a unique name of source explains. The lack of IP doesn't mean the loss of ethics. Take for instance the Sony PS4 Winter Lineup music video. Sony puts out a trailer to advertise their game. This video has segments of original animation, except it's not original. All the movements was plagiarized from everything from small independent animators to big companies. Copying animation to this level isn't protected by copyright, which you can tell because no one ever got sued for it despite copying from even big companies. But Sony took down the video and the guy lost his job. What I mean by bringing this up is just because it's legal to steal media doesn't mean that that people are suddenly okay with stealing media. In fact, while I don't have numbers for these specific artists, there are loads of examples of Twitter exposing art thieves that get tons of retweets and give the original creators a boost. There's even a rare couple of YouTube examples with some victims having way more subs now than they did back then. Anyway, the point of the animation tracing example was that even when copyright isn't a factor, consumers still care about copying and plagiarism. And that's great, because it means there's a demand for ethics in media. And that effect is amplified by the total removal of copyright. Here's why. The great thing about not having 
IP. If someone copies something and consumers deem it to be an unethical copy, there's no reason to support them. Whereas before, with IP, consumers had to choose between their morals and getting to watch their favourite property without IP, a company with better ethics can replicate the same product to fulfil the demand. So if a company or creator is known for plagiarism or has a project they're currently trying to get funding for that blatantly plagiarises, another company can offer the exact same project but promise to pay a percentage to the victim of plagiarism. Assuming the new company was good enough to replicate the same product, they would still be making money they wouldn't be otherwise, so why wouldn't they so long as there's demand? I bet it would become an industry standard for adaptions to advertise how much is going back to the original creator in order to compete with other adaptions. Adam Neely suggests with respect to the abolition of music copyright, that artists should instead cite their musical inspiration much like an academic would rather than simply being disallowed from using that inspiration in the first place. I think that music composition copyright should be replaced by a citational system of sorts, where if you write something, if you write a piece of music, you gotta cite your sources. After that, you can do whatever you want with it. Think about this, when you go to school and you write a paper, you're expected to one, research, and two, cite where you got your ideas from. The process of citation is at the core of academic research. In order to build on a general body of knowledge, you need to know what came before. As a researcher, you're expected to connect your work to the past. In fact, if you don't cite previous work, you're not a serious researcher. You don't know what you're doing. Along with Adam's note of this already being commonplace in academia and being enforced through social pressure, we see it also in comedy, with comedians often coming under fire for telling other people's jokes verbatim. And in the spirit of encouraging this idea of citing one's sources, I endeavour to include scripts with footnotes to reference material for all of my videos. And you can also see any videos or books I reference here in the description. And whilst you're down there, maybe donate or become a channel member. Furthermore, in a world of intellectual monopoly where only wealthy creators are able to enforce these monopolies, you should expect plagiarism of the poor to occur more frequently. This is because people are encouraged to assume that any copying without lawsuit must be morally acceptable, else the copied from party would sue for copyright infringement. Also, the poor are less likely to engage in copying which is both morally and legislatively acceptable for fear of costly lawsuits. Therefore, intellectual monopoly tends to create a class of those who are able to create and those who are not able to create. Many of the justifications of intellectual monopoly being a genuine property stem from the faulty labour theory of property, such as the defence provided by Ayn Rand and her Randroid followers. Patents and copyrights are the legal implementation of the base of all property rights rights, a man's right to the product of his mind. Every type of productive work involves a combination of mental and physical effort, of thought and of physical action to translate that thought into a material form. What the patent and copyright laws acknowledge is the paramount role of mental effort in the production of material values. These laws protect the mind's contribution in its purest form, the origination of an idea. Kinsella explains the issue with the labour theory of property. As noted before, some libertarian IP advocates, such as Rand, hold that creation is the source of property rights. This confuses the nature and reasons for property rights, which lie in the undeniable fact of scarcity. Given scarcity and the correspondent possibility of conflict in the use of resources, conflicts are avoided and peace and cooperation are achieved by allocating property rights to such resources. And the purpose of property rights dictates the nature of such rules. For if the rules allocating property rights are to serve as objective rules that all can agree upon so as to avoid conflict, they cannot be biased or arbitrary. For this reason, unowned resources come to be owned, homesteaded or appropriated, by the first possessor. The general rule, then, is that ownership of a given scarce resource can be identified by determining who first occupied it. There are various ways to possess or occupy resources, and different ways to demonstrate or prove such occupation, depending upon the nature of the resource and the use to which it is put. Thus, I can pluck an apple from the wild and thereby homestead it, or I can fence in a plot of land for a farm. It is sometimes said that one's form of occupation is forming or creating the thing. For example, I can sculpt a statue from a block of marble, or forge a sword from raw metal, or even create a farm on a plot of land. We can see from these examples that creation is relevant to the question of ownership of a given created resource, such as a statue, sword, or farm, only to the extent that the act of creation is an act of occupation, or is otherwise evidence of first occupation. However, creation itself does not justify ownership in things. It is neither necessary nor sufficient. One cannot create some possibly disputed scarce resource without first using the raw materials used to create the item, but these raw materials are scarce, and either I own them or I do not. If not, then I do not own the resulting product. If I own the inputs, then, by virtue of such ownership, I own the resulting thing into which I transform them. To reduce the labour theory of property into absurdity, consider Crusoe sneaking onto Friday's land, using his clay and moulding a pot with it. Crusoe has certainly expended much labour in making this pot, but yet he does not own it. 
In fact, Crusoe may well owe Friday damages for ruining his pristine clay. The reason for this is that it's not labour which is the fount of property rights, but conflict avoidance as described above. Regardless, Rand continues, an idea as such cannot be protected until it has been given a material form. An invention has to be embodied in a physical model before it can be patented. A story has to be written or printed. It is important to note in this connection that a discovery cannot be patented, only an invention. A scientific or philosophical discovery which identifies a law of nature, a principle or a fact of reality not previously known cannot be the exclusive property of the discoverer because a he did not create it and b if he cares to make his discovery public claiming it to be true he can't demand that men continue to pursue or practice falsehoods except by his permission but on what grounds can the randroid claim any of this to be accurate if it is mental labor which gives rise to the intellectual property right, why must this be accompanied by physical labor in manifesting the idea? And why is it that scientific or philosophical discoveries can also be owned, given they too require mental labor to discover? Moreover, what exactly differs Einstein's discovery that E is equal to MC squared from Edison's discovery that a certain arrangement of material will yield an electric light bulb? Surely Edison is just discovering a very, very specific fact about reality, as opposed to Einstein's far more general fact. Moreover, it is not made clear why such a distinction, even if it could be rendered objective, is at all ethically relevant. Still, both require mental labour. On these grounds, no randroid can consistently claim that A is A without first paying royalties to the descendants of Aristotle, thus leaving their entire theory in ruin. Rand attempts a solution to this not only in asserting that somehow E equals MC squared is a fact of nature, whereas that some arrangement of materials will yield an electric light bulb is not, but also in asserting that intellectual property does not last forever. Ever. The right to intellectual property cannot be exercised in perpetuity. Intellectual property represents a claim, not on material objects, but on the idea they embody, which means not merely on existing wealth, but on wealth yet to be produced, a claim to payment for the inventor's or author's work. No debt can be extended into infinity. But why on earth couldn't these debts be extended into infinity? Surely any debt that A owes B could indeed be passed on to B's heirs. Rand does not provide an answer, instead stating, if it were held in perpetuity, it would lead to the opposite of the very principle upon which it was based. It would lead not to the earned reward of achievement, but to the unearned support of parasitism. It would become a cumulative hen on the production of unborn generations, which would ultimately paralyse them. Consider what would happen if, in producing an automobile, we had to pay royalties to the descendants of all inventors involved, starting with the inventor of the wheel and on up. Indeed, Rand is correct to shudder at a world where you have to pay royalties to uncountable inventors, but this applies to all intellectual monopoly grants. The parasitic effect, she points out, only becomes more pronounced the longer the intellectual monopoly lasts, but it still exists on an intellectual monopoly lasting three seconds as opposed to three months. Furthermore, this strikes me as an entirely utilitarian argument. We must limit the scope of IP, because if we don't, bad things will happen. This is fitting, as it is often that we see utilitarian arguments used in support of IP, say on the grounds that it will increase wealth, which is good, but it is not at all clear that the establishment monopolies over some set of ideas will indeed increase wealth. If I am able to patent the discovery of how to make a better mousetrap, but not discoveries in philosophy or science, we should expect resources to shift away from discoveries in philosophy and science towards these supposedly more practical engineering pursuits. Furthermore, even if we were to assume that these utilitarians were correct, that intellectual monopolies do indeed increase wealth, the point of law is not to increase wealth, it's to ensure justice. And to see where the utilitarian ethic, among other ethics, objectively fail to ensure justice, making them false, you have to watch this video where I lay out the objectively correct anarcho-capitalist legal code.